Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Tatro. I'm the director of Ford's Theater. Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all tonight on behalf of Ford's Theater community. Uh, I offer a warm welcome to Mayor Sharon Pratt, Michael Steele, and historians Dr. Christopher Bonner and Dr. Michael Burlingame. At Ford's, we explore the legacy of Abraham Lincoln and celebrate the American experience through theater and education. We are happy to host the Institute for Politics, Policy, and Histories, Lincoln, a prov providential president as part of their Defining Fathers series. As organizations, we share a love of history, education, and an appreciation for the humanities. When the idea of this program was first brought to our attention, I knew that it had to take place at Ford's Theater. Today, Lincoln's consequential legacy continues to instruct, illuminate, and inspire people across the world. In many ways, this is why we have gathered this evening to investigate, to learn, to be inspired, and to be reminded of who President Lincoln was. I thank you all for being in attendance. One bit of housekeeping before we continue on. I'd like to remind everyone to please silence your phones. It'll make for a much more enjoyable evening for everyone. Um, and please help me welcome to the stage Shanna Bartley, the Policy Director at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Shanna. Thank you, Paul. We would not be here without your bold leadership as director of Ford's Theater. We are grateful to be at this historic and sacred site where tonight we launched the Defining Fathers series. My name is Shauna Bartley. I'm a policy officer for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. While the foundation is located in Mr. Kellogg's hometown of Battle Creek, Michigan, I am proud to call Washington, D.C. my home. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Institute for Politics, Policy, and History's presentation of Lincoln, a providential president. Tonight's dramatic reflections and panel discussion with eminent historians will take us on an eye-opening journey about the evolution of President Abraham Lincoln, his vision for a stronger union, eloquence, humility, and legacy of leadership have enabled him to become known as one of the most inspiring leaders in American history. Just as we were proud to support IPPH's Founding Fathers series last year, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation is proud to support the Defining Fathers series this year. The event kicks off the Defining Fathers series, a compelling mix of vodcasts and in-person live-streamed programs. It reveals the depth of the lives, motivations, and contradictions of President Abraham Lincoln, President Ulysses S. Grant, and freedom advocate Frederick Douglass. These leaders played a pivotal roles in transforming the nation's capital from a small country town into a metropolis. Their collective efforts to preserve the United States, abolish slavery, work towards equal citizenship for all, and reconstruct a bitterly divided but legally emancipated America led to the city and the country we have today. This series builds on the dialogue from last year that examined the lives of Presidents Washington, Madison and Jefferson, as they were pivotal to establishing the nation's capital in the South, along the banks of the Potomac. Programming examined the economic and cultural conditions that enabled the sustained institution of slavery, despite the founders' establishment of America's Declaration of Independence, affirming all men are created equal. The W.K. Kellogg Foundation supports the Institute's work given the alignment between our missions. Embedded within all we do as a philanthropy is our commitment to advancing racial equity and racial healing, developing leaders, and engaging communities in solving society's most pressing and pervasive problems. We believe that to achieve more equitable communities, our nation must confront often difficult truths about the impact of systemic racism and racial bias throughout our history and within our present day experiences. This work is critical to developing the trusting relationships necessary to transform systems that hold us all back. Narratives about our shared past are powerful in shaping how we think about and understand our present. 
That is why we are pleased to support the Institute for Politics, Policy, and History in their efforts to illuminate history and create spirited dialogue around the issues that perennially challenge our nation. I'm excited to learn from tonight's program, and I hope you are too. Now it is a great honor to introduce Sharon Pratt, the Institute for Politics, Policy and History's founding director and the former mayor of our great city, Washington, D.C., as well as Michael Steele, IPPH's senior advisory co-chair, MSNBC co-host of The Weekend, and former Republican National Committee chair. Please help me welcome Mayor Pratt and Chairman Steele. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, I, my name is Sharon Pratt, and I am the, uh, some people, know, okay, some people knew. <laughs> uh, I'm the founding, founding, oh, that must be my family. Thank you. <laughs> I'm the founding director of the Institute of Politics, Policy, and History. We're going to call it IPPH, housed on the campus of the University of the District of Columbia. And all right. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you more about IPPH in just a moment. Uh, but first, I would like to acknowledge, first I want to thank Ford's Theater. Paul Traytalk, uh, we, you and your team are just magnificent. Thank you for yeah. your partnership. We are really a, a, a grateful to you. We're also grateful for, to W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Uh, and they've been a wonderful partner to IPPH. And maybe I should mention here, what is our mission? To rediscover the history of Washington, D.C. That is our mission. And as amazing as it is, we may have uh, uh, Fergus Borderwick with us tonight. He's, he is a great scholar. There's a little scholarship about the capital of the country and this great community a community with its own vibrant personality. And that is the purpose of IPPH. And so through our programs, we try to help as excavate that history. We did it last year with the Founding Fathers. We're doing it this year with the Defining Fathers, individuals, Americans, who had much to do with this becoming a major metrop metropolis. Now, I'm going to introduce my co-anchor in just a minute. He's too important for me to, to do it too soon. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge, I, it's difficult to know for, for certain who's all here, but I know that uh, Jack Evans was supposed to be with us tonight. Uh, and he's a former member of the council and on the Arts Commission. I know Gretchen Wharton's with us, and she's the vice chair of the Arts Commission. You know, Carol gave me this great list. Uh, Myers, uh, the, uh, who is here, is the executive director of the Arts Commission. Um, and uh, Chappelle, Reginald Chappelle, who's with the National Park Service, is with us. Um, and I also, good, <laughs> I got something right. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge our, our members of the advisory committee. Also first, UDC Board of Trustees, Dr. Carolyn Rudd and Warner Sessions, but also members of our IPPH Senior Advisory Committee. Uh, almost all of them are working. Uh, Mark Thompson, uh, Carol Fulp, uh, and then I'm going to introduce uh, this gentleman last. And another person that I wish to acknowledge tonight, she's an iconic personality. I almost hate to use that expression because people overuse it. But she is the owner of one of the most revered institutions in this city, and that's Virginia Ali with Ben's Chili Bowl. There she is. So tonight, we're very honored to be here at Ford's Theater because tonight we're going to talk about our 16th president who had a profound impact on this community, this great nation's capital. Uh, but the person who's best suited to talk about that 16th president and to get this show going is none other than the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, Abraham Lincoln, was the first president who was a Republican. Yeah. Um, 
he he's also, this gentleman, uh, the co-host of MSNBC's The Weekend. It's a great program. You've got to check it out, Saturdays yes, and Please Sundays. <laughs> and anybody with an earshot knows that the reason he became a Republican has everything to do with the profile and the positions and the policies and the personality of the man we speak of yeah. tonight and that's Abraham Lincoln. We are so honored to have with us this evening, Michael Steele. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all very, very much. It is, it is always a special treat for me to, to do anything and to be a part of anything in my hometown where I grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, Petworth in the house. There we go. Just wanted to get that out. Um, it is, it, it's a real special treat. It's a very special night. And um, just a quick uh, acknowledgement again to Ben's Chili Bowl. Thank you for getting me through so many years of crazy. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, these are very interesting times for all of us. And it is a reflective moment for me um, as a member of the Republican uh, Party. Um, and particularly when I consider uh, the party's history and its legacy, to be in this space especially, uh, and to know the sacrifice that one man gave for his country, and to look around at some in my party today who do not recognize that sacrifice. Um, and that's very difficult, uh, which is why conversations like this are very, very important. Um, IPPH is, has played, I think, an enormously important role in that, and I remember getting a phone call from the mayor, and she is like, I have an idea, and I want you to be a part of it. <laughs> okay, so you know how this conversation is going to go, right? It's like, okay, where do I show up? When do I need to be there? Um, and she, she shared with me this, this vision, her vision, um, of what the storytelling of this city should be about and to house it at such a fine institution as the University of the District of Columbia was another important part of that legacy. Um, and it's really kind of tying our, our presidents um, that we started our, our conversation with uh, last year uh, and now continuing this year to not just uh, Washington, but the institutions uh, inside of this great city and the people, most especially, all of you who, some of whom are native Washingtonians, a rare bird indeed. Um, uh, others who've come here thought they'd be here for two years and have been here for 40. Um, and you're now part of this important legacy and this important history. Um, central to that is something that Lincoln um, not only discovered about himself and had to rely on, but the country would come to lie on, and that is leadership. Uh, and that leadership was important to unify the nation, uh, to level up the conversation on equality uh, at a time when no one wanted to have that conversation, uh, to be an example of integrity uh, in the face of enormous opposition, and threats, uh, and to exhibit something that I wish more of our uh, officials, and certainly in my party, uh, would exhibit, and that's moral courage. Moral courage. Um, it all together inspired this man, uh, who uh, story is a fascinating story of happenstance and opportunity. Uh, to speak out against the dis divisive uh, rhetoric um, then uh, and today. It gives us that voice to look within ourselves and discover our own moral courage, our own sense of integrity, our own purpose for equality, and our own leadership. That leadership doesn't rest just in the people we elect but it rests in all of us as citizens because we've been endowed by our creator with inalienable rights for sure, but we've been empowered by our constitution to be the government that will guide this great experiment uh, along the way. And I think Lincoln grew to understand that in a very particular way. Uh, so when you think, step back and examine the moment, you realize that this man's legacy 
President Lincoln's uh, legacy has been written about more than any other president in history. And so tonight, we're going to focus on three aspects of his life that have defined not only his presidency, but our country as a nation. And certainly, as a young kid growing up in this city, I was inspired uh, by his story and his connection to my community in a very unique way. And understanding and appreciating how difficult it was for him to embrace, ultimately, uh, the freedom of the black man and the black woman. It's one of the big reasons why I don't refer to myself just as a Republican. I am a Lincoln Republican. And I try to remind people today what that once stood for, because it's important today. So as we go through this evening, we're going to look at Lincoln's unrelenting determination to preserve the Union how Lincoln defined the war in moral terms, and Lincoln's own evolution on enabling black citizenship. So we're going to begin with the preservation of the Union. President Lincoln was determined to preserve the Union. He was intolerant of those who disrespected the Union. And most importantly, he was intolerant of those who undermined the very principles that girded this country. For an immersion to Lincoln's words, we will experience dramatic reflections this evening from a very accomplished actor, Daniel Hubble. So let us begin. Sections of Lincoln's first inaugural address, March 4th, 1861. I hold that in contemplation of universal law and of the Constitution, the union of these states is perpetual. Descending from these general principles, we find the proposition that, in legal contemplation, the union is perpetual, confirmed by the history of the union itself. It follows from these views that no state, upon its own mere motion, can lawfully get out of the union that resolves and ordinances to that effect are legally void and that acts of violence within any state or states against the authority of the United States are insurrectionary or revolutionary according to circumstances. Section of a message to special session, July 4th, 1861. The assault upon and reduction of Fort Sumter was in no sense a matter of self-defense on the part of the assailants. And this issue embraces more than the fate of these United States. It presents to the whole family of man the question whether a constitutional republic or a democracy, a government of the people can or cannot maintain its own domestic foes. It presents the question whether discontented individuals, too few in numbers to control administration according to organic law, in any case can always, upon pretenses made in this case or any other pretenses, break up their government and thus practically put an end to free government on the earth. It forces us to ask, is there in all republics this inherent and fatal weakness? Must a government of necessity be too strong for the liberties of its own people or too weak to maintain its own existence? So viewing this issue, no choice was left but to call out the war power of the government and so to resist force employed for its destruction by force in its present preservation. The power of those words speaks to Lincoln's unswerving commitment in honoring the very principles upon which our nation was founded. He meant it. He felt it. 
And he began to understand exactly what that's, this moment meant for not just him as president, but for the country. Mayor, I think in many respects uh, that the Civil War was not just about the end of slavery. Uh, we know it clearly didn't begin with that as the focal point. Right. That was not what, what it was all about. But Lincoln incrementally began to decide and to move his administration uh, and his actions um, in a way that reflected that this great war needed to have a moral purpose to it, that there was something more about this that he felt we needed to focus on as a nation. Um, and that ultimately led to the central purpose becoming ending slavery. Right. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we put this program together not because of where we are today, but because of Lincoln's profound impact on this suddenly becoming, instead of a backwater venue, a real metropolis because you had to have a federal presence to prosecute a civil war. And I think it's what you've just observed, Michael, is so powerful. You know, you don't get to change the rules just because you don't like the outcome of an election. And that's the point that Lincoln made. And he, he was determined to marshal the resources of the federal government so that they would honor the understanding, the compact that they made when they became a part of the United States of America. You don't change the rules in the middle of the game. So, but you're right. After a point, it sort of had a regional overtone to it. Uh, the North thinking industrial, the South thinking a planter uh, system where that very much relied upon the enslaved people. Without a doubt, what the element that was percolating beneath all of this was the issue of slavery. And so Lincoln said, this war has got to be, have a moral mission. It can't just be about a different philosophy on the economy. Right. And that's when he started moving in the direction of emancipation. Section of Abraham Lincoln, Letter to Horace Greeley, Editor, New York Tribune, August 23rd, 1862. My paramount object on the struggle to save the Union, and my paramount object on the struggle is to save the Union, and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leave others alone, I would also do that. Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. By the President of the United States of America, that, on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them to, in any efforts they make for their actual freedom. That the executive will, on the first day of the January aforesaid, by proclamation, designate the states and parts of states, if any, in which the people thereof, respectively, shall then be in rebellion against the United States, and the fact that any state or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto at elections, wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated, shall, in the absence of strong countervailing testimony, be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the United States. Now, therefore I, Abraham Lincoln,
President of the United States, by virtue of the power vested in me as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States, and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion, do on this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, and in accordance with my purpose, so to do publicly proclaimed for the full period of 100 days from the day first above mentioned, order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof, respectively, are this day in rebellion against the United States, the following to wit. Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, except the parishes of St. Bernard, Black Mines, Jefferson, St. John, St. Charles, St. James Ascension, Assumption, Terrebonne, La Forche, St. Mary, St. Martin, and Orleans, including the city of New Orleans, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, except the 48 counties designated as West Virginia and also the counties of Berkeley, Accomack, Northampton, Elizabeth City, York, Princess Anne, and Norfolk, including the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. And by the virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within shall desig said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free, and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence, unless in necessary self-defense, and I recommend to them that, in all cases when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution, upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed done at the city of Washington this first day of January in the year of our Lord 1863 and of the independence of the United States, the 87th. Sections of letter to Albert G. Hodges, editor, Commonwealth Newspaper, Kentucky, on April 4th, 1864. I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. And yet, I have never understood that the presidency conferred upon me an unrestricted right to act officially upon this judgment and feeling. I have not controlled events, but confess plainly that events controlled me. You think about, and just in a moment, just think about August of 1862 and January of 1863. What happened? What, what did Lincoln see? What did he come to know that moved him from a position 
where he confesses, well, if we keep the slave, if we save the union by keeping slavery, I'll do it. If we save the union by eliminating slavery, I'll do it. To the point where he would then say, all black men and women enslaved in this union are now free. That's the moral compass that was locked in on that North Star of freedom. More than likely unrecognizable by Lincoln himself at the time, as expressed in, in the letter to Albert Hodges, where he says, I have not controlled events, but confess plainly that events controlled me. A man in leadership at a moment in a nation's crisis, leaning into the events around him and fixing his moral compass. Whereupon he says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. These words reflect Lincoln's moral compass. So Mayor, what, what do you think were the pra pragmatic consequences of the emancipation? And, and how much of Lincoln we see reflected in that given how probably conflicted he was, even at the moment he's writing this freedom for black men and women? Well, that was one time being from D.C. helped. He, we, <laughs> we were a federal territory, so he had the right to do something about it. Uh, and so D.C. was the first venue uh, to benefit from emancipation. You know, there's been a lot of back and forth about Abraham Lincoln in this city in the last few years with the liberation of Freedmen's statute, you mm -hmm. know. And does that reflect that he was the great emancipator and there was no agency on the part of people, uh, black people, African American people? Of course, we know that it wouldn't have happened without agency on the part of African Americans as well as others like Garrison and Thaddeus Stevens and others. But I'm with you, Michael. I think he had a moral center. There are people who are pragmatic, and he was mm -hmm. pragmatic. He says, the Constitution doesn't authorize me to do this, but now that I'm in a war, right. heck, if I'm going to let you benefit, those of you who are waging war against us, from the asset of enslaved people, I'm going to use that as my license and my excuse uh, to emancipate contraband, as uh, uh, General Butler said. Mm -hmm. uh, but he had a moral center. Those were tough decisions. And he understood the difficulty of it. it. Took him a minute to get there on black equality and citizenship, but he had a moral center. Even when he was in Congress, as you know, right. one term, he did try to enact legislation that would emancipate African Americans in this city, because he said, we certainly should have control in the District of Columbia. They have too much control, you know, I think that, but <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> he, and, and so you have to, uh, acknowledge that about Abraham Lincoln, I think. So let's conclude by looking at Lincoln's evolution on the full citizenship for black men and women. From one of Lincoln's debates with Stephen A. Douglas during the campaign for one of Illinois' two United States Senate seats, as reported in Chicago Daily Press on October 15, 1858. I am not now nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. That I am not, nor ever been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office. I am, as much as any man, in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Message to Congress on signing an act abolishing slavery in Washington, D.C. on April 16, 1862. Fellow citizens of the Senate and House of Representatives, the act entitled an act for the release of certain persons held to service or labor in the District of Columbia has this day been approved and signed. I have never 
doubted the constitutional authority of Congress to abolish slavery in this district, and I have ever desired to see the national capital freed from the institution in some satisfactory way. Hence, there has never been, in my mind, any question upon the subject except the one of expediency, arising in view of all the circumstances. If there be matters within and about this act which might have taken a course or shape more satisfactory to my judgment, I do not attempt to specify them. I am gratified that the two principles of compensation and colonization are both recognized and practically applied in the act. In the matter of compensation, it is provided that claims may be presented within 90 days from the passage of the act, but not thereafter. And there is no saving for minors, femmes covert, insane, or absent persons. I presume this is an omission by mere oversight. And I recommend that it be supplied by an amendatory or supplemental act. Second inaugural address, Washington, D.C., March 4th, 1865. Fellow countrymen, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than was first. Then a statement, somewhat in detail, of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed genuinely over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All know that this interest was, somehow, the cause of the war, to strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained, neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with, or ever before, the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men 
should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we may be judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That far, neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offenses cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that which he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from the divine attributes which the believer in a living God always ascribed to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God will that it continues until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid with the, with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphans, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Sections from Lincoln's last speech, April 11th, 1865. We meet this evening, not in sorrow, but in gladness of heart. The evacuation of Petersburg and Richmond and the surrender of the principal insurgent army give hope of a righteous and speedy peace whose joyous expression cannot be restrained. In the midst of this, however, he from whom all blessings flow must not be forgotten. A call for a national thanksgiving is being prepared and will be duly promulgated. Nor must those whose harder part gives us the cause for rejoicing be overlooked, their honors must not be parceled out with others. I myself was near the front and had the high pleasure of transmitting much of the good news to you. But no part of the honor for plans or execution is mine. To General Grant, his skillful officers, and brave men all belongs. The gallant Navy stood ready but was not in reach to take active part. As a general rule, I abstain from reading reports of attacks upon myself, wishing not to be provoked by that to which I cannot proper, properly offer an answer. In spite of this precaution, however, it comes to my knowledge that I am much censured for supposed agency in setting up and seeking to sustain the new state of Louisiana in this I have done just so much and no more than the public knows. We all agree that the seceded states, so called, are out of their proper relation with the Union, and that the sole object of the government, civil and military, in regard to those states, is to again get them into their proper practical relation. The amount of constituency, so to speak, on which the new Louisiana government rests would be satisfactory to all if it contained 50, 30, or even 20,000 instead of only about 12,000, as it does. 
it is also unsatisfactory to some that the elective franchise is not given to the colored man. I would myself prefer that it were now conferred on the very intelligent and on those who serve our cause as soldiers. The Gettysburg Address. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, November 19th, 1865. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who, gave their, who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we do so. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Hubble. He did a great job and, and gave us a sense of our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. Thank you very much. And I hope that you observed in terms of the reflections, in terms of the public remarks of Abraham Lincoln, they were sequenced as they were because Gettysburg Address, he was probably the president more than even Thomas Jefferson that made the Declaration of Independence, the principles of it, front and center for the United States more than even the Constitution. But secondly, it was when he made those remarks after Appomattox on the 11th of April from the White House that he, that's when John Wilkes Booth and his co-conspirators said, no, we're not going to kidnap him. That's what they'd been thinking about. No, we're going to kill him. Because what did he say? That black men should have the right to vote. And that's when John Wilkes Booth said, that'll be his last speech. That's what he said, and it was. So we now are going to talk to those who are true Lincoln historians, who will give us even deeper insight into this regarding this 16th president who has become almost a semi-deity uh, <laughs> in American history. Uh, and I'll turn that over to you, Michael. No, absolutely. Uh, we're very excited uh, to welcome uh, our historians uh, to, the, uh, to the stage. Before we do, I want to encourage our audience to use right. the Slido QR code on the flyer uh, to input questions to be asked of our distinguished panelists during the Q&A period. So we would like to get your questions so that I can uh, read them here. So technology, right? This is how it works. So let's welcome Dr. Christopher Bonner and Dr. Michael Burlingame to the stage.
Dr. Christopher Bonner is an associate professor of history at the University of Maryland College Park. He specializes in African American history and the 19th century United States. His book, Remaking the Republic, Black Politics and the Creation of American Citizenship, centers free blacks in the legal transformation of the United States during the mid 19th century. He also has provided commentary for Lincoln's Dilemma, a four part documentary series offering a fresh ex exploration of President Lincoln and the complex journey to end slavery. He received his BA from Howard University and PhD from Yale University. Dr. Burlingame holds the Chancellor Naomi Lynn Distinguished Chair at Lincoln Studies University of Illinois, Springfield. He has written and edited 20 books on Lincoln. Among them, Abraham Lincoln, A Life, a 2,000-page award-winning biography. 2,000 pages? <laughs> right, right, right. Dude, I mean, okay. It's, it's a good book. I mean, be sure to buy it. You don't have to read it, but be sure to buy it. All right? 2,000 pages. Okay, most recent books include An American Marriage, The Untold Story of Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd, and The Black Man's President, Abraham Lincoln, African Americans, and the Pursuit of Racial Equality. He is a graduate of Princeton and Johns Hopkins, all right, alumni there, of Johns Hopkins <laughs> University. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I guess we'll begin with you, Dr. Bonner. Um, Abraham Lincoln, as we know, was always against, always felt slavery was immoral. Hmm. He all, you are agreeing? I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm listening actively. <laughs> Okey dokey. <laughs> but he had a bit of a distance to go right. as regards certainly the notion of equality mm. and citizenship. Could you give us a sense of that journey? And do you think, as, as you know, I suggested, that he did have a moral center, especially living in America? But hmm. what is your thoughts? Yeah, so I think. Um, so first, thank you for the question. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, I think when we think about uh, questions of citizenship, citizenship is ultimately about belonging. It's about legal belonging, about social belonging. Uh, and so when I think about Lincoln's evolution, I think you've, you've highlighted here in the, the opening um, presentation a couple of key landmarks. You know, I think 1862 is a, is a major landmark. Lincoln uh, invites into the White House five black ministers and essentially encourages them to encourage other African Americans to lead the country. Uh, Lincoln's promoting, he's endorsing this policy of colonization, the idea that black folks should be removed either to West Africa, to Latin America, to the Caribbean. Uh, and so that's a, you know, a thing that is upsetting to a lot of African Americans that Douglas and others are very critical of. Uh, I think that we should recognize as a part of Lincoln's politics. But then in 1865, as we heard uh, in some of his last remarks, he is saying that uh, black soldiers should be allowed to have the right to vote. And so that's a, a real endorsement of black political belonging. So we can't understand Lincoln without recognizing the dramatic nature of that change, right? To go from a person saying black folks sh should leave the country, uh, or at the very least wondering whether black folks have a place in the country, to a president, a person who is saying black folks should not only live here, but be a part of the political community. It's, it's a remarkable evolution. At the same time, I think it's important that we recognize that the evolution was incomplete. Um, Lincoln says black soldiers should have the right to vote. Thousands and thousands of white men for decades had been voting without having served in the military. And so I don't, I don't necessarily see it as an evolution to a point of embracing black equality. It's an evolution to a point of accepting black belonging on some sort of qualified terms. And, and, and really, you know, um, part of the tragedy of Lincoln's story is that his evolution remained incomplete because his life was cut short. So um, that's sort of how I'm thinking about mm -hmm. that evolution. I, if I could, just to go back to the point of Lincoln's evolution on equality, mm. he did. You're saying he didn't quite get there, despite some of the some of the outward signs of what he did: the Emancipation Proclamation, wanting African American men to vote. Mm. He still had he still had sort of a box that he couldn't check. 
Yeah, well, I think there's a, I think it's the, uh, I think it's important to, to draw a distinction between freedom and equality. Okay. Uh, Lincoln did incredible work. Uh, no one can dispute that Lincoln did incredible work to promote black freedom. But freedom was one part of a process of making racial justice, of making racial equality. Uh, you know, saying that all men should have all black, all men should have the right to vote on the same terms. That would have been a call for equality, and that's something that's different from what Lincoln said. Uh, and different from what Lincoln did in the Emancipation Proclamation. And certainly different from what we saw through, uh, from Reconstruction on, onward into Jim Crow, how that incompleteness was, was played out. So Dr. Burlingham, you, you've got this, this very complex man who himself is in many ways conflicted uh, about this issue of slavery. Um, and is trying to find all these different solutions, inviting African Americans to the to the White House. Say, okay, why don't y'all just get on a boat and go, <laughs> okay, just just go, um, not necessarily wanting to confront uh, the very hard truth in front of him that he would have to eventually get to. Tell us a little bit about this complex man. I mean, what what was it in him? Given his humble beginnings um, and his educational track, his you know sort of happenstance nature of w how he wound up in Congress and eventually mm -hmm. becoming president, founding a party, <laughs> being part of founding a political party, um, what what was it about him that made him tick in in that we may not understand or appreciate given what we know about him today? Well. Um, that's a big question. Uh, I'll try to save you 1,600 pages of reading <laughs> and, and 400 pages of footnotes <laughs> uh, by first suggesting that uh, the meeting that Lincoln had with five black leaders of the Washington community on August 14, 1862 is, is widely misunderstood. And the best interpretation we have of what Lincoln was up to on August 14, 1862, was written the following month by a leading black minister here in Washington. He was the head of the Israel uh, African American Episcopal Church uh, here on Capitol Hill, well, mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill down the street. <laughs> um, and uh, his name was Henry McNeil Turner. And he was a regular correspondent for the, one of the leading black newspapers at the time, the Christian Recorder, which was published in Philadelphia. And he writes an elaborate uh, response to the Emancipation Proclamation that Lincoln announced on September 22nd, so just a few weeks after the meeting with the five black leaders. And he said the, the notion that Lincoln was an enthusiast for, for a, a black uh, resettlement abroad is grossly exaggerated. He was, he's no stickler for that. Um, what he was really getting at in this address, which by the way, was very unusual because he invited a shorthand reporter to come in. There's the only time we know that he did that, to take down every word that he said to be published in, in mm -hmm. uh, the press throughout the country. And uh, so what, what uh, Henry McNeil Turner says is what the president was trying to do was to convince white people who, were, he, who he knew were going to be very upset about the Emancipation Proclamation, mm. which he was about to issue. So he had written the Emancipation Proclamation and told his cabinet in July that he was going to issue it. And his Secretary of State wisely said, the timing is terrible. We've just suffered a major defeat in our campaign against Richmond. And if on the heels of that humiliating, ignominious defeat, we issue an Emancipation Proclamation, it's going to seem like a desperate measure and will be regarded as insincere. So let's wait till we have a victory and issue it on the heels of that victory. And Lincoln says, I hadn't thought of that. It's a good point. So, he's, so what happens between July uh, when he tells the cabinet that he has, he's written the Emancipation Proclamation and, and he doesn't want them to, he, he, you, you can make minor suggestions about it, but I'm going to do this, no matter what you say. Uh, in September, Lincoln is thinking, what can I do to minimize the white backlash that I know is going to be generated by this Emancipation Proclamation, particularly in the border slave states of Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, 
and in southern Illinois, southern Ohio, southern Indiana, southern Pennsylvania, which are filled with people who have a lot of, who, many of whom came from the South and have uh, no sympathy for the right. anti-slavery movement. So Lincoln has been told by any number of people uh, in the border slave states, including some of his best friends, uh, look, people down here are not going to accept emancipation unless you couple it with colonization. And so what he was doing was not really speaking to those five gentlemen. He was speaking to the nation, particularly to the border slave states and to the lower north. That uh, my administration is serious about colonization. Uh, that you don't have to worry that there is going to be this great tsunami of free slaves coming swarming across the Mason-Dixon line and across the Ohio River. That we are, we, we are going to, as a government, uh, make it possible for black people to resettle abroad if they want to. This is strictly voluntary. And Lincoln also believed that there were a, a number of black people, like, like John Russell, uh, the founder of the graduate of Bowdoin College and the founder of the first black newspaper, who said, I'm moving to Liberia. Forget about any chance we'll, black people are ever going to have in the United States to get anything like first class citizenship. And what I think was on Lincoln's mind is that people who felt that way deserved some haven, some refuge, where they could enjoy first class citizenship. He didn't, and, and Henry McGill Turner says, he doesn't believe that large numbers of black people are going to leave the country. That he knows that. Uh, but he does believe that there should be a, a place where people can go if they are uh, pessimistic about the prospects mm -hmm. of enjoying first class citizenship. And uh, we, we owe it as a government to them to, to provide them with that kind of uh, refuge. And, so, and, and about citizenship, when Lincoln gives that speech on April 11, 1865, which, as you quite rightly point out, and this is something that people don't fully appreciate. Yeah, is that, that man who was sitting up there got killed not because he issued the Emancipation Proclamation There's or because he supported the 13th Amendment. He was murdered because he called for black voting rights. And John Wilkes Booth turns to his compatriots and says, that means N-word citizenship. By God, that's the last speech he's ever going to give. By God, I'm going to run him through. And three days later, he killed him. And therefore, I think it's appropriate for us in the 21st century to think of Lincoln as much of a martyr to black rights as Martin Luther King or Medgar Evers or Viola Liuzzo or James mm -hmm. Reeb or Mickey Schwerner or James Cheney or all those people who got killed back in the 1960s as they championed the civil rights revolution of that time. Well, let me follow up, if I may. Sure. Um, and it's sort of a tough question, but I have, let me begin with, I have no doubt that he had a moral center, and I have no doubt that he truly believed that slavery itself was immoral. But we do live in America, and there is a racial caste system in America, and it's very tough, be you white or black, frankly, <laughs> whatever you are, not to be impacted by it. So how does this man, who was born into such abject poverty, not that poverty does it in and of itself, he had limited access to books, you know, he manages to evolve to this human being you're such, that could transcend this, who could uh, have a vision uh, w with such muscle to it, uh, was it just uh, organic, or was it the influence of people like Frederick Douglass, or Thaddeus Stevens, or William Garrison? How did, it, what were the influences that got him to that? Well, I think it, when Lincoln says in the Hodges letter, uh, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. That's, the evidence is there that that's the case. When he's a young legislator, uh, he sticks his neck out uh, when almost every legislator in the Illinois uh, General Assembly said, uh, we're going to condemn the abolitionist movement. Um, 94 of them said that we condemn the abolitionist movement, and six of them, including Lincoln, said, eh, we're, no, we disagree. And then two of those guys, uh, including Lincoln, go a step further and say, we believe that slavery is based on injustice and bad policy. And for somebody in Springfield, Illinois, who was ambitious politically to stick his neck out that way, whoa. And then Lincoln says in 1860, my position on slavery was, was enunciated in 1837. I've felt that way ever since. So I think he hated and loathed and despised slavery from early on. And my interpretation of that 
is partly he had a, a, an extremely sensitive conscience. And it, it, it's hard to say why some people have a very sensitive conscience and some, some people don't. Some don't have any. Right. Right. Now, but, but, <laughs> so when Lincoln was growing up, for example, on the frontier, it was considered great sport among the young boys to torture animals, to take a turtle and break its shell and put a hot coal on its back, or, or to throw a snake into the fire and watch it wriggle. And, and Lincoln condemned that uh, and, and scolded his, his playmates. And you know, where does that come from? And I think anybody who had that kind of moral sensibility would find the, the enslavement of people to be uh, outrageous. Um, and a second reason why I think Lincoln hated and loathed and despised slavery from very early on is because he, his father treated him like a slave. It's one of the interesting things about Lincoln's anti-slavery pronouncements is he, is he doesn't emphasize many of the issues that other anti-slavery leaders did. He doesn't talk about the breakup of slave families. He doesn't talk about the physical brutality of slavery. He doesn't talk about the uh, slaveholders' suppression of civil liberties. He doesn't talk about the creation of a quasi-aristocratic social order in the South based on slavery. Instead, as, he, as in the second inaugural, he, he says it's an outrage, an outrage that the slaveholders have rewritten the word of God Almighty himself, who said, in the sweat of thy brow shalt thou eat thy bread, hmm. to read, in the sweat of somebody else's brow shalt thou eat thy bread. And so his sense of justice was, was offended by that, partly because his father would keep yanking him out of school and renting him out to neighbors. And every, every penny that Lincoln made uh, doing backbreaking farm labor that he was rented out, went up, was turned over to his father because the, the rule of uh, custom and law in those days was not that parents didn't own children, they couldn't sell them, but the, the labor, any, any potential earning capacity that a child had and any money that was made had to be turned over to the father. Hmm. And, and Lincoln's father was pretty insistent on that. Um, now, I, I believe that that it was one of the reasons that he identified with his slaves, and he identified his father with the slaveholders. Now, hmm. a lot of my friends, I, I am a, a something of a, <clears throat> of a psycho historian. That's one word, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> there are psycho historians, two words, but I fancy that I do not belong to that category. <laughs> what, can I, what can I tell you? Um, and, uh, and, and so, um, I, I think, uh, my, 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 most historians are from Missouri. <laughs> they say, show me, what's your evidence? <laughs> and the problem is with something like that, when, you're, when you argue about unconscious motivation, it's very hard to prove it with a kind of documentation that historians like, like Dear Diary, today mm -hmm. I decided to denounce slavery because my father treated but me like a You've done a lot of research on Lincoln, <laughs> right, and so right. you are at liberty to have an intuitive <laughs> right. sense of it. But right. let, me, let me ask Dr. Sure. Bond of this, if I may as well. Sure. Um, you know, when we talk about Abraham Lincoln, especially here in Washington, D.C., mm. we often give a lot of credit to our uh, great sage from Cedar Hill, that Frederick Douglass. Mm. But there were also other thought leaders here who had an influence. Do you think they are inappropriately overlooked in terms of their impact on uh, Lincoln? Yeah, you know, I, I think that there's a way in which um, any sort of, uh, approach to trying to make sense of a, a major change or a major choice that a person makes that, that uh, people might be drawn to one figure or one sort of impetus, right? Uh, Frederick Douglass changed Abraham Lincoln, right? And, and uh, you know, Michael's written about the ways that Lincoln was talking with other black folks. Um, Henry Highland Garnett, Sojourner Truth, Martin Delaney. So like, we know that Lincoln was, was talking with and think, thinking uh, in response to, at least, maybe not thinking alongside, but thinking in response to a lot of other uh, prominent African Americans. One of the ways that I've, I've been thinking about uh, influences on Lincoln, though, is, is a sort of broader African American political community. Um, so when I think about the, um, the problem, some of the problems that black soldiers faced, one of the major uh, issues that they were dealing with in 1863 and 64 was unequal pay. Uh, and soldiers from famous regiments like the 54th, they were petitioning Lincoln and saying, um, we're doing a soldier's duty. We should deserve a soldier's pay. Like our, our blood is, is in the field. We should be treated like any other soldier, but they were paid unequally 
to white soldiers. And so they are writing to Lincoln and saying, pay us equally. But what they're really saying is, and again, this is 63 and 64, they're saying, we deserve equality, not just we deserve freedom. And so I think, I think of them as part of this wider African-American political community beyond the people whose names we can call and whose papers we can dig into, people like Delaney and Douglas. Uh, they were part of this black com political community that was driving Lincoln toward that moment in 1865 when he does embrace this partial version of, of black equality. Dr. Bur Burlingham, let's, let's uh, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, level up the conversation around uh, probably the most prominent uh, influencer, Frederick Douglass, uh, which um, Dr. Bonner just mentioned. What, what was that influence? Uh, that Frederick Douglass had. Did, was there uh, respect, mutual, one way? Um, how, how did um, Douglass impact Lincoln? And in what degree did Lincoln impact Douglass? Well, uh, as a preliminary response, I'd like to say <clears throat> that Lincoln is sometimes thought to have been educated here in Washington about racial justice. That out in Illinois, he didn't know people like Frederick Douglass and Martin mm -hmm. Delaney and Sojourner Truth and, and people like that, whom he met in Washington and spoke with, who came, we invited to the White House. But in fact, Lincoln, living in a racially mixed neighborhood, um, knew about friends of his down the road who were black people who worked in the Underground Railroad. He had clients who were black people. He had friends who were black people. He had servants who were black people. And these were not just menials. These were people who were real friends. And one of the most remarkable men that he knew in Springfield was, was a gentleman named uh, Florville. Uh, and Robert Florville was a, a remarkable guy. He was a barber, but he was also a very successful real estate speculator and entrepreneur. He spoke multiple languages. He spoke he played many musical instruments. Lincoln loved to hang out with him. Uh, and when Willie dies, when Lincoln's son Willie dies in the White House in February 62, uh, we have this letter from Florville. Uh, and Florville says, um, and you can tell by the letter, it's a long letter and it's very warm. You can tell the, the feeling tone is very, it's, it's not a servant talking to a, 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 an employer or a client talking to a lawyer. Uh, it's a real friend and he's talking about how much he admired Willie and how much he thought he was so much more advanced than other boys of his age. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about it, Lincoln's dog, your dog is being taken well care of, mm -hmm. and your house too because the people who rented it don't have children to ruin it. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think Lincoln comes, the, the, the old notion was, and this Benjamin Quarles, great black historian, made this argument that Lincoln didn't really know any black people out in Springfield that were, were any account that, that he never would come to regard black people as particularly competent or self-assertive or all that. And, and he knew people, like, people who were in the Underground Railroad, people who were insisting that black people have schools. Uh, that these were guys that he would meet. And he, would, he lived in this racially integrated neighborhood. And when he walked to his office, he would pass by black people. And all of those that we know about that interacted with him had the most, said he was an instinctive racial egalitarian. He, he just mm -hmm. didn't have a, a, a racial, uh, racist bone in his body. So, how did, uh, ahead, but I want to get to how did the Frederick Douglass piece yeah, okay, though? Okay. So, what what was that relationship, and how did they influence each other's thinking about this issue as well as others? Well, Frederick Douglass offered an explanation. He said that he thought that that Lincoln was the only white man that he knew who didn't make him feel self-conscious about his race, um, uh, and that. Um, that one of the reasons that, that he had that kind of instinctive egalitarian sentiment, particularly in the relationship to Douglas, is that they both started from the bottom. That Lincoln grew up, everybody on the frontier lived in what we would consider today poverty. The Lincoln family lived in poverty by the standards of the frontier. Mm. And that he raised himself so high through his, through his hard work, his, his commitment to reading and, and uh, uh, hard work that, uh, that he identified, that they both rose up uh, from the bottom rung uh, to the top, and, and they, they respected one another. Um, 
And so I think uh, Frederick Douglass clearly intensified Lincoln's racial, instinctive racial egalitarianism. Um, uh, and, and then uh, about Frederick Douglass's attitude toward Lincoln, it, uh, and you alluded to the controversy about the Emancipation Memorial over on Capitol Hill, the 1876, uh -huh. when Frederick Douglass gave a speech in which he said Abraham Lincoln uh, was preeminently the white man's president. And we black people were only a stepchildren. Well, imagine my surprise when I'm doing my Lincoln research in the Library of Congress, which was many years ago. I'm going through the Frederick Douglass papers. And in his handwriting, I see this speech, June 1st, 1865. It says, Abraham Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president. I said, good Lord. And this was an important speech. It was given as a eulogy to Lincoln on June 1st, 1865 in Cooper Union, arguably the most prominent space mm -hmm. in the country to give a public address. And it was covered by the New York press. And, and that, sh that phrase, emphatically the black man's president, shows up in the New York press. Uh, and so I thought, my goodness, how could I have missed this uh, speech of Frederick Douglass's because Yale Press had, dis had published five or six volumes of uh, very fat volumes. My, my <laughs> volumes are magisterial. <laughs> those, those are fat. Right? Um, and uh, I said, I couldn't believe that I missed it. So I went to the 1865, uh, June 1st, and it wasn't there. And so I wrote to the people at Yale, no offense, and said... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Nothing said, to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> and said, how was it that you didn't include this remarkable speech? No response. I called and left a voicemail message. No response. Well, those of us who went to Princeton aren't surprised that Yale would conduct itself in this fashion. <laughs> but, well, what can I tell you? Um, and uh, and so, so the question is, why would Frederick Douglass in 1865 say Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president, uh, and then in 11 years later say he was uh, the white, white man's president? Uh, and I think the answer is this, that in 1876, when he spoke at the dedication of the right. Emancipation Memorial, he had, the, he had a big black audience, so lots of black, because that statue was created by money right. that yeah. blacks had contributed, um, uh, solely by money that blacks right. had contributed. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, at that point, he also had the power elite of the country as part of his audience. He had the president, the vice president, mm -hmm. cabinet members, congressional leaders, Supreme Court justices, and so on. Um, and so what, so what he was doing on that occasion, it seems to me, what he was doing was saying, do not let Reconstruction go down the drain. That in the aftermath of the Civil War, the 14th and 15th Amendments get passed uh, uh, in an attempt to get guarantee black civil rights and then voting rights. Um, and they were enforced for a while, rigorously, by, by President Grant. But then by the mid-1870s, by 1876, public interest seemed to be waning in racial justice. Um, but a, a, a real depression had begun in 1873, and mm -hmm. that public opinion in the North seemed to be absorbed with matters of uh, restoration of prosperity and, and financial issues and greenback issues and, and the like. And, and Frederick Douglass was saying, I think this is the subtext of his speech and my, my interpretation, is you guys don't let Reconstruction go down the drain. Mm -hmm. And don't think of Reconstruction and the attempt to uh, endow black people with voting rights and civil rights is some kind of bleeding heart liberal gesture by some sentimental so he guy. He sort of right. capitalized yeah. he on the occasion. Tough, he was a tough-minded guy who, was, who had the interest of your race at heart, and he knew that it was in the interest of the white race right. to have black people enjoy equal citizenship. Can I, can I, a yeah, little, ahead, so I, I think that part of what I think we're getting at is, is Lincoln's complexity, right? I, mm -hmm. So as Douglas says in 1876, Lincoln was the white man's president, and that's sort of like this warning, as you're saying, Michael, uh, don't let policy be dictated by the needs only of white people. Right. But what Douglas also says is under his rule, black folks were enlisted into the military. Under his rule, they were uh, provided with a legal, a legal avenue toward freedom. So I think Douglas is recognizing Lincoln's complexity, and I think it's, it's important for us to recognize that complexity as well, even as we see 
I would never get up here and say Lincoln wasn't, a, seems like a pretty good guy, right? He seemed like he, he had friends of all races, like he was not generally a jerk. Like I think that's right. a, a, good, right. a good way to describe him, but I also think that it's important to keep in mind the, the particular policies he was enacting and that for much of the early Civil War, as Douglas saw him, he was a white man's president. And he became, as the war progressed, uh, as he moved toward emancipation, he became a black, black man's president, president. A, a president under whose rule all of these changes right. could and, be implemented. Right, and you know, it's, a, it's still a complicated issue yeah, in America. Yeah, exactly, right, yeah. So let me ask you though, I wanna ask, because I know you did write about Mary Todd Lincoln, but I'd like both of your thoughts. Um, she's gotten a sort of quite a, a mixed reviews uh, as the first lady. Well, the thing that I found interesting for this, just as a preamble, for this series, as we talk about the three Americans who had such an influence on the city of the suddenly becoming a meaningful metropolis, mm. all of it around the Civil War, such a contrast to the ones who insisted that the city or the capital be in the South, which were three planters, privileged men, Washington, Jefferson, Madison. Madison right. Amazingly, in this period of this such a crisis period, the three who suddenly emerge are the full expression of the American dream. They come from abject poverty. Hmm. I mean, it's, uh, Grant probably was better off than any of them, and he was, uh, had a, a hard scrabble beginning. Of course, Frederick Douglass, I mean, worse than that, he was right. enslaved. He was hoping to get fine food, you know, just to exist. And then Abraham Lincoln, who apparently lived in a cabin where there was no floor or window until his father remarried. Hmm. So, I mean, it was, and yet all three of them marry women above their station. That is, Grant marries Julia Dent Grant, uh, who was a privileged woman. Uh, her family were enslavers. Douglas marries a free black woman, Anna Douglas. Hmm. Uh, and then Lincoln marries Mary Todd Lincoln. My point simply is that Mary Todd Lincoln had the option to marry Stephen Douglas, as I gather. That he well, was, that's... The, uh, uh, are you question that? <laughs> well, she, she, Douglas, funny, she said, well, it wasn't really very serious. There but was no she real. was still she arguably was a, was... A, 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 a woman of some circumstance. I know that's a back and forth. But let's just, she saw in him the potential to be an extraordinary person. Having hmm. that kind of affirmation, do you not think that that was an asset? Or do you think people have said she was bipolar, she had a lot of issues, that she was a liability? What is your opinion of Mary Todd Lincoln? Well, in many ways, she was a liability. Um, Lincoln very seldom let down his hair about his personal life and his marriage. but. Um, in a document that I discovered, I, I couldn't believe this hadn't been part of the historical record, but um, when I, the, the first day I went out to do original research and unpublished sources, I, I, I wrote my first book called the, the Inner World of Abraham Lincoln. It's a series of psychological essays about his relations with his wife and his children and his hmm. parents and his depression and his midlife crisis, all that sort of thing. I wanted to call it Shrink and Lincoln. Um, <laughs> but my stuffy old publisher, the University of Illinois Press, wouldn't go along with that. Um, and, and so I drafted it based on published sources. I was teaching at a Connecticut College in New London, uh, and uh, uh, so I said, all right, I, I know that I've got the published literature, I've got pretty well under control, now it's time to go out and do some manuscript research. And I go to Brown, and the first day I'm at Brown, which if you can't be here in Washington doing research or in Springfield on, on Lincoln, Providence is still the best place to go, the Brown University. Because um, John Hay was Lincoln's assistant personal secretary and, and all kinds of materials that he generated. Uh, uh, anyway, it's a good place to do it. So I go, and the first day I'm there, I discover this, this essay, this, this reminiscence by, by one of Lincoln's closest friends, Orville Browning, uh, who was a lawyer and a, and a Whig activist and a, and a Republican activist in Illinois. Uh, and who knew Lincoln very well, and when Lincoln's son dies, he asks Browning to go and take care of the funeral arrangements. Uh, they're, they're very close friends, politically and socially. And they'd been in the legislature together, and he was particularly fond of Browning and, and Mrs. Browning. And Browning writes to, and tells Nicolay, uh, uh, Lincoln's principal White House secretary, um, that um, Lincoln told me several times in the White House that he was terrified that his wife would do something to humiliate him publicly. 
And I said, well, where's, where's this evidence been? And I asked the people at Brown, and, and they said, well, we, we've cataloged it, we made it available, but nobody's seen it. And I, so I, I, I published those, those interviews. Um, and uh, the fact is she did humiliate him, because she, she wanted people appointed to office, like commissioner of uh, public buildings in Washington. It was a very important position for the city of Washington, the commissioner of public buildings in those days, uh, who was a scoundrel who said, you know, I'll give you a diamond bracelet and a necklace if you'll get me that job. And you think, what? Um, and uh, so there are all kinds of episodes like that where she engages in uh, promoting rascals to positions in the federal bureaucracy. Um, but do you think he would have seen that he had the capacity to go after the presidency on his own? Do you think that she was irrelevant to that pursuit? No. I think he was, he was ambitious to begin with. Yes. She didn't create his ambition. I didn't say she did. Right. And I didn't mean to imply <laughs> it. But what I, will say, what I will say is that she turbocharged it. Yeah. Um, and he might have been uh, uh, happy to be a senator or something. But to be president, she really wanted to be first lady. And so she would. Mm. And Lincoln's favorite play was Macbeth. And the main reason oh, be because, because 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 of fatalism. And Lincoln was a great fatalist, and well, there's no better literary representation of fatalism than Macbeth. But also, secondarily, it's a it's a play about a a, a husband and wife, uh, a loveless marriage in which the wife is more ambitious than the husband. Um, and so I think that 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 resonated with him. And Bonner, Dr. Bonner, what do you think of Mary Todd? Like? So, I, I, frankly, I, I can't speak to Mary Todd know, and, the, and yeah. the relationship, but I, I can maybe, uh, if, as a preview to the, to, the, to the Douglas event, right? Um, I think in a very literal way, we would not have a Frederick Douglas as we know him without Anna Murray Douglas. And, and this is, you know, Anna Murray uh, saved the money to buy a train ticket for Douglas to escape, for Frederick to escape from, from Baltimore. She borrowed uh, clothing and, and freedom papers for Douglas to use as, as a ruse on his train trip. And then beyond that, once they made it to the North into freedom, Anna Murray stayed, Anna Douglas at that point, stayed home with their four children and raised them while Douglas was taking the train back and forth across the North to become a famous abolitionist and, and to, to travel to the UK to uh, enact that sort of anti-slavery political life. So um, I, I think it's critical to, to think about the various material ways in which um, a woman like Anna made Frederick Douglass. And, and I could, if I could add a footnote to my earlier observation about the role that Mrs. Lincoln played in Lincoln's life, I think her, she helped not only to turbocharge his ambition, that's, that's important, but she also contributed to his political career by making his home life so miserable. <laughs> and, uh, this, I, I, this, is what his, this is what his friend said, <laughs> that, that, he, that he, he was the only lawyer all, the lawyer, all the lawyers in Springfield couldn't make enough money just practicing law in Springfield in those days. So every spring and every fall, they would go out on the circuit, and they would go from one county seat to the next to the next and practice for a day or two, and then maybe a week or two, and it, it varied. But all the attorneys um, would go out, um, uh, uh, but none of them would go on the whole circuit, except Lincoln and, and one other. That is to say, at every single, and he was the only one who didn't go home on weekends. And they, they all knew and then said that, that his home life was so disagreeable, that she was so, such, uh, gave him such a hard time. She, she struck him, she, she attacked him physically, she ridiculed him in front of other people, uh, and he, she chased him out of the house with a knife, chased him out of the house, throwing things at him. I, and then this, we, we have testimony from neighbors, because in those days, you didn't have air conditioning, like you had the windows open, and the, and the houses were close together, so you sort of knew what was going on next door and down the, down the block. And uh, so it was assumed that, that uh, and, if, and as a result, he did a lot of what we would call networking. That is, when he was out on the circuit, it wasn't just practicing law, but it was also politicking and chatting with people and getting mm -hmm. to know the jurors and the judges and, and all that. Um, and also, one of the things that made Lincoln such a successful president was his remarkable ability to take nothing personally, to not get upset by insults, by Charles Sumner, Horace Greeley, 
George McClellan. When you think of the very difficult people that Lincoln had to deal with and how he kept his temper. Uh, and, and one of my favorite Lincoln documents is, is a letter he wrote to a young captain who was squabbling with his superior officer. And Lincoln said, the advice of a father to a son, then quoting Polonius in, in Hamlet, saying, uh, beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. <laughs> and Lincoln said, that's great advice, except it's not the best. Quarrel not at all. No man determined to make the most of himself can spare time for personal contention. Still less can he afford to take all the consequences, including the vitiating of his temper and the loss of self-control. Yield greater things to which you can show no more than an equal claim, and lesser things, though clearly your own. Well, and then he says, if, if, if it, well, uh, that's enough. I was going to say, would, would uh, modern-day Republican presidents understand that principle? <laughs> uh, so, so, Dr. Bonner, I, I want to, in that context of mm. modern-day, the modern-day party, the modern-day political climate, you look at someone like Lincoln um, and everything that he had to deal with, uh, keeping in mind that, you know, the, the Republican Party, um, when he assumes the presidency, is six years old. <laughs> uh, the, the country is, is entering into uh, conflict. Um, but then there are all these other things that are going on as well. You still have to run the country mm -hmm. despite the war. You still have uh, entanglements and engagements abroad. Uh, what lessons sh could we, should we learn from Lincoln today? Uh. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm stuck on this idea of like quarrel not at all. It's like maybe that's nice <laughs> advice, but there's no way that Lincoln as president didn't quarrel, right? Like so much of his job is arguing in pursuit of the things that he wanted, right? But it's right? not impugning people's motives sure. or their character or the like. And, sure, and so right. I think he didn't it, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah, to I think, disagree I think is okay, think of, uh, but the quarrel to, it wasn't to all about engage him. in odd hominem attack. <laughs> well, yeah, right, so, this right? is, so this is something that I would right. think uh, right. we should take. So I, I think of like arguing as, a, as an important aspect of what Lincoln did. He argued eventually for emancipation. He argued for black enlistment. He argued for uh, rights for black soldiers. What I think is, is really fascinating about Lincoln, there's, I, I think it's easy to be drawn to him as a leader. as like, a, this is what a president should be like, or this is what a leader should be like. But I think that when I think about what the what Lincoln did to promote these various causes, I see him as a as a collaborator, as a person who was working alongside a lot of other people. The the, the policy of emancipation came from Lincoln listening to Congress and listening to uh, what black folks were demanding. Right. So Lincoln was not leading the move toward. Lincoln was not leading. I will stand by that argument. The move toward the ending of slavery. Lincoln was following the actions of thousands and thousands of other Americans, black and white, mm -hmm. right? So Lincoln listened when he needed to, and he was flexible, he was dynamic in his thought, and he was willing to hear from other folks, even folks who were quarreling, uh, and, and take uh, information and ideas and, and then sort of implement these policies that were really... Was that, um, was that the sort of... Valuable. Right? Yeah, yeah th right. but th you, you strike an interesting point there because it really is what Joyce Kearns Goodwin sort of wrote about in her book, which is a great book, Team of Rivals, yeah. was all that arguing and all that quarreling that members of his cabinet engaged in. He, you know, may or may not have done it. He his heard, fair he share, heard but, dueling but he perspectives, listened, right? Sure. I, I, think, I, think about that, but I think about that, but, but that's still, that's a way of thinking about Lincoln as listening to people who were essentially his peers or close to right. his peers. But again, if I, if I could tell the story of, of emancipation, when I talk with my students, I almost kind of tell it backwards. So the Emancipation mm. Proclamation in 1863 uh, is, so as Lincoln's drafting it and, and issuing the preliminary proclamation, he's explicitly saying that what he's doing is enforcing the laws that Congress have implemented. And Congress has implemented this confiscation policy in 1861 and 62 that says the military cannot be used to return fugitive slaves. Congress implements that confiscation policy, 
building on the contraband policy that was implemented in the camps by people like Benjamin Butler in the spring of 1861. And Butler is doing that because black folks are running to the military camps and banging on the doors and saying, let me in, I can help and keep mm. me out of the hands of my owner. So all of that, that sort of, all of that action, starting with those dozens and then hundreds and then thousands and thousands of slaves running to the camps, that is the, those are the voices that Lincoln is hearing and engaging with when he implements the emancipation policy. So that's why like, he's listening far beyond. He's hearing people far beyond uh, Seward and, and, and others in, right. in, the, in the cabinet. So I, and I think, that, I think that that's invaluable. Right? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, uh, if I could follow up on that. Um, I hear what you're saying, and I don't, I mean, obviously, you're a real scholar, and I'm certainly not <laughs> going to disagree. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, so much of my life has been in, in, in politics, and, mm. and what I know is that those who survive it know that they have to build a constituency mm. if they're going to do something. Mm. As they say, uh, uh, a leader without a following is just a man out taking a walk. Mm. You know? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so what, what he seems to be is a, the ultimate pragmatist who at least has some moral center. I hear what you're saying. If it hadn't been for all of these individuals pushing and prodding, he never would have gotten there. Mm -hmm. So to back to the question that uh, Michael Steele is asking though, and I ask both of you, what can we learn from Lincoln and how would you rank him in the pantheon of presidents? Uh, I don't, I, I don't want to touch the, the question of ranking. I, I, you know, that's just not how I think about uh, history. I, I suspect, you know, 2,000 pages would mean he's number one. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that, uh, I think that we should learn from Lincoln that people in power should listen and that good things yeah. happen right. when people in power listen to those who have less of it. Well, uh, I, I share uh, Chris's reluctance to engage in the uh, <laughs> ranking business. Um, but what I t tell my students is uh, there is uh, a prevailing view in the historical profession uh, that historical change it doesn't depend on one man or one person, one woman. Um, it's the product of vast and personal economic forces, demographic forces, what have you. And, and I tell my students, a lot of that is true. But there are occasions when one person can make a big difference. Yeah. And I think in, in the history of this country, the two people who are most uh, apt to be described that way, and, and justifiably described that way, are George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. It's very hard to imagine that the country could have moved from the Articles of Confederation, oh. where we were sort of like the, the UN, not a real government, um, but a debating society, um, to, to a real powerful <laughs> central government that, that has made a huge difference. Um, and that the willingness of the American people at the polls, uh, voting uh, in each state, do, do we approve this constitution or not, um, for those people to say, okay, even though we have just revolted against a strong central government, and, and, uh, but we're willing to give a, this a shot because the Constitution was written at a convention which was presided over by George Washington, and everybody knew that Washington would be the first president. I don't think that the Constitution could have been written and adopted without that kind of trust that people had mm -hmm. in the judgment and character of George Washington. And similarly, it's very hard for me to see, and I, I admit my bias, um, <laughs> that there's any president who could have led the, war, uh, the North to victory in the Civil War between Jackson and Theodore Roosevelt, who could have done it. When you think of all the other media, the Martin Van Buren's and the, yeah. the Benjamin <laughs> Harrison's and, and the like, yeah. uh, it's, it's hard to imagine. So we've got, we've got a little bit of time left and we want to, uh, because we have a lot of questions, thank y'all very much for the questions. Uh, so we've got some questions for our, our esteemed panel, um, and 
We'll start with this one. Uh, Frederick Douglass counseled the president. When did it start in his moral compass? When did he start in his moral compass to accept that counsel, what that, what that counsel offered him? So this is a thing that I'm actually really interested in and I don't know. There might be a, a simple answer to this. Like, to what extent was Lincoln reading Douglas? Reading him, reading him actually. Like, so when they meet, I think that Lincoln says something like, uh, I've, I've, I've read about you or I, I, I know you, but I think he means it in like the sort of broader sense, not personally. So I don't know, uh, it, and, and part why I'm curious about this is because in, in 61 and 62, Douglas is super disappointed in Lincoln's hesitancy to embrace black emancipation and, and to, to make the war what, Link, what Douglas sees as obvious. It's, it's a war against slave owners, and therefore it must be a war against slavery, right? So Douglas is writing some very angry things about Lincoln uh, in Douglas's Monthly. But then when they meet, uh, and, and across the sort of conversations that they have, especially in the, the I think, after Lincoln's second inauguration, Lincoln says something like, uh, what did you think about the speech? Like, I value your opinion more than any other. And so I don't know if, if or when Lincoln was actually reading Douglas, but the fact that by 63 they're meeting and 64 they're, they're, uh, Lincoln's proposing this uh, emancipation plot and asking Douglas to take part, and then 65 he's saying that, I think that Lincoln cared deeply about what Douglas thought. He thought that Douglas was a valuable uh, critic. And to me, that suggests that he must have known some of the things that, that Douglas was writing in the earlier stages of the war. That, and, that, and then Douglas, likewise, over that period, began to see Lincoln differently than he did in 61 and 62. I think, I think that Douglas, you know, as, as Michael said, Douglas is, is, is playing politics, right? So when Douglas is writing really angry things about Lincoln, it's not necessarily because he thinks he's Lincoln is a bad guy, right? He's pushing. He's, 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 pushing. he's leaning yeah, on the president cool. and saying, <laughs> essentially, you're the white man's president. Is that who you want to be known as, right? Is that how you want to be seen? And, and, and trying to sort of make that, uh, use rhetoric to his advantage in that way. So, so Michael, to that point, some historians uh, question here, or, or writers have researched President Lincoln, have claimed that he didn't willingly end slavery, but in fact, that was never his plan. He hated and loathed and despised slavery from the time he was young. If he had done what he wanted to do, he would have issued the Emancipation Proclamation on March 4th, 1861. But he couldn't. As, as he says in the Hodges letter, I, I didn't think that the mm -hmm. office of the presidency endowed me to take <laughs> measures uh, which were simply in accordance with my own values and moral concerns. I was limited by the Constitution. Uh, yeah. And uh, and so the and, and one of the things I, I, I apropos of that that I, I would like to emphasize apropos of, of your observation, Chris, about about Lincoln saying black soldiers should have the vote. That's not what he said. He said that those who served in the military and those who were very intelligent, by which we should, <laughs> which I'm sure right, what, right, what he meant, which he meant, which he meant, literate. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he, he knew plenty of literate black people, um, and particularly two gentlemen from New Orleans who come and say, I have a we have a petition of 1,000 people who are taxpayers in New Orleans who and would like to have the vote. And, and Lincoln then endorses black voting rights for the, uh, these uh, literate as well as the, and when Frederick Douglass heard that speech, on April 11th, 1865, he was very disappointed that it only applied to veterans of the army, of the military, and to the very intelligent. He said, I and my fellow abolitionists were disappointed by the limited scope, but we should have recognized that that was a very significant speech oh, because absolutely. Abraham yeah. Lincoln learned his statesmanship in the school of rail splitting. And to split a rail, you take a wedge, and you put the wedge, thin edge of the wedge in, and then you drive home the thick edge of the wedge. And we should have known that once he publicly called for black voting rights, he was inserting the thin edge of the wedge and you could count on him to drive home the thick edge of the wedge. And so the assassination, of course, aborts that. Right, and that's one right. of the great tragedies of so, our time. Uh, uh, there are two questions that are really kind of dovetail each other. Um, so the, the first one is, 
with respect to uh, why were some areas in Virginia and Louisiana excluded from the Emancipation Proclamation? Uh, and why did President Lincoln not make certain that everyone, including the blacks in Texas, know they were free in a timely manner? So the last question, I, I think, so I, I think in a lot of ways this is about the reach, uh, the, the movement of, of, the US, of US soldiers, right? The, the idea is that places that are actively in rebellion are places where emancipation is gonna happen and places that are, uh, have been retaken by the US military, in theory, those places are not actively in rebellion. So that's part of the limitation. But I think that the point about Texas emancipation, which is speaking to the, the, the problem of Juneteenth, the late notice of emancipation in that part of the country, that's a product of the limited reach of the military. And, and really, it's a, it's a product of, um, it's a reflection of, I think, a, a key limitation of the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln says, slaves in Alabama are free. But he's not in charge in Alabama, right? And so mm -hmm. what Lincoln is doing is, again, really radically transformative. He's opening a door to emancipation. But what's necessary is for black folks to find that door and find out how to walk through it, right? And so I think it's, it's uh, the limitation here is a limitation of the reach of the president, the reach of the military in the midst of the war. But the reason that he uh, exempted those parishes in Louisiana and those counties and, and cities in Virginia is that the only justification for the Emancipation Proclamation that was legal and constitutional was to subdue the rebellion. The rebellion yeah. And yeah. You, you can't take the slaves from these people who, who've been subdued. Right. Um, There's no rebellion. You're, you're, right. Yeah. You're, you're not undermining their ability to continue the war. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's sorry, I, so, I'm just thinking it's uh, one of the things I noticed in the documents y'all chose, and I don't know if that was intentional or not, is uh, a lot of Lincoln's language is very dry. It's like oh, so oh. deeply legal right. because he's being very <laughs> technical, right? Like right. there's, there, the only, I don't know, this might be an overstatement. The only thing that stands out to me as beautiful about the Emancipation Proclamation is that then, the, thenceforward, and forever free, right? right? right. Everything else is uh, a, a lawyer, right, yeah. And so <laughs> it's, it's written by a lawyer, and I think that that's, uh, both of those things are important in terms of the, like who he was, right? He was very specific and particular and technical, but he also had these, these you know, he could have brilliance in, in terms right. of the beauty of his writing. How different do you believe the Reconstruction era would have been <laughs> under Lincoln instead of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson, Andrew Johnson yeah. excuse me. There's uh, a big difference. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's another one of these questions that I, I think is tough for me because, of, because it's necessarily speculative, right? I, I think that the, the point that I made, the point that you made, Michael, that you said that Douglas has made, that Lincoln would split the rail, right? We, we can see that Lincoln was evolving, uh, and, and, and even that he was evolving quickly as circumstances Progress, And so we can think and we can hope that Lincoln would have uh, pushed for policies that were, uh, for the time, radical in terms of uh, creating racial equality. At the same time, if, 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 you know, back to the last thing I said about the sort of limits of the reach of the executive, the reach of the military, uh, the policies of Reconstruction as they existed were radical, right? The 14th mm -hmm. Amendment, the 15th Amendment, these were incredibly radical, but by 1880, Douglas is able to say that these amendments are a dead letter in most of the South because the reach of the government was not there to uh, make real the legal equality that had been created in, in, in the Constitution. And so um, but, but Lincoln, what, what Lincoln was Lincoln, not going to go personally into the South and eradicate the Klan, right? Even as the government did a lot to suppress that, uh, and even as the Klan was only one manifestation of the forces that challenge racial equality, those forces were massive and extensive. And they, I think they were so massive I, and extensive, but it does speak to this idea of leadership, though, because part of, you would think, part of that evolution of Lincoln would lead him, just as it did to declare the Emancipation Proclamation, mm. um, to, to sort of, at the same time, have that, that moment at Gettysburg um, that sort of, you know, reconciliation of, of, of relating to the men uh, who gave their lives, that he would have continued in that evolution and this idea of the South holding on to the vestiges of slavery 
in the form of Jim Crow and other means, the Klan, you think he would have just let that happen? I, I, no, but I don't know that, neither did, neither did Grant, right? I think it's important to, to, to right. recognize that Grant was, was in charge for a lot of Reconstruction, but would he have been able to eradicate racism in the hearts of, of Americans? No. I don't right. Know. That, well, that's a fair point, because we, <laughs> <laughs> we, we still work in that issue out, so. Um, this was an interesting question. What opposition, external or within himself, did Lincoln face in the final months before issuing the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation uh, in January of 63? Well, the, the principal concern he had was what I alluded to earlier, that, that you don't want to issue an Emancipation Proclamation which will be regarded as insincere uh, mm -hmm. and a, a desperate practical mm -hmm. measure. Uh, now, he emphasizes that it is a practical measure only because he feared, and this is one of the reasons that the, that the Emancipation Proclamation was here on my tie, mm. with a little lunch, I see. Um, and the reason he did that was because he feared that, um, that the emancipation of slaves would be challenged in the courts. And let's remember, the Supreme Court was then still presided over by Roger Tawney, yeah. the author of the mm -hmm. Dred Scott decision. And so he wanted to make it constitutionally bulletproof. Uh, and that's why he, he bends over backwards. And a, a lot of people criticized right. him, because here's this guy who, who has a remarkable ability to, to, to generate soaring rhetoric and appeal to the deepest and most, most uh, positive uh, feelings of, of, of uh, liberalism and, and generosity and progress. Um, and he, he has these cramped documents mm -hmm. with all this, and you think, but then he, then he, then he in, in the second message, to Congress in December of 1862, he, he talks about how uh, th this, in some magnificent language, um, about the meaning of reconstruction, of, of, of emancipation, mm -hmm. uh, and, and speaks in very glowing moral terms, very soaring moral terms. Um, so, so he felt that way, but, he, but the legal documents were phrased in ways that he hoped would be bulletproof if emancipation were to be challenged in the courts. Yeah, when I was lieutenant governor, uh, outside my office window uh, on the state capitol grounds was this statue of Justice Taney. <laughs> Looked at the top of his head every day. Wow. <laughs> so much fun. Um, two for here. John Brown is my favorite white man in history. <laughs> That's not me. This is the person saying this, uh, Maceo. Uh, what was Lincoln's reaction to John Brown's raid, and how much had he known of John Brown, John Brown pre-raid? And companion question, can you compare Lincoln's views on race to those of someone like John Brown? Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, no, so, so, no, there's a lot there. Um, I, I, maybe I'll try to tackle a couple of pieces of, the, of, of this. I, I think Brown was relatively well known after his actions in Kansas as, as a sort of uh, leading villain of, of that space, a, 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 a known attacker and, and, and murderer, I guess, of a number of pro-slavery settlers uh, in what came to be called Bleeding Kansas. Uh, and I, I can't think of anything uh, specific to quote. I, I suspect Michael might be able to, but I, I, I suspect that Lincoln, like most other, the vast majority of other white northerners was outraged and concerned about what uh, Brown had done. And, 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 you know, part of how we can think about this is that uh, even Frederick Douglass was concerned, uh, I wouldn't say outraged, but concerned about what uh, Brown had done, in part because Douglass was um, technically a co-conspirator, given that he knew some of the details of, of what Brown was planning. Um, the... The reason, so the, sorry, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be brief. The, the reason the, the question about racial, I, racial views is so complicated is because Brown, as far as we know, was, was really deeply invested in uh, black freedom and uh, embraced black people as a part of his political projects. But I think of, I almost don't know, I don't know how much Brown really thought of anyone as his equal. Like I think that, uh, I think of the way that he developed his plan to go to Harper's Ferry and, and, and sort of recruited these men, but 
then didn't really have much of a real plan right, beyond right. going there and, and essentially ended up making himself a martyr. In so doing, made all these other men, black and white, some of whom were his own sons, made them martyrs as well. And so I, I Brown talked much more radically about racial equality than Lincoln did. Um, I don't know how much that actually did for the people around him. I, I guess so that's just part of the, the, the tension there for me. Well, Lincoln, Lincoln said, apropos of Brown, as many Republicans did, we, we applaud his anti-slavery views, uh, we deplore his tactics. And let's, let's remember, his tactics were to take broadswords and slaughter, chop up people in cold blood mm -hmm. because they, they, they uh, were supposedly supporting slavery. Uh, and not people who had actually participated mm -hmm. necessarily in any of the uh, actions against the, uh, the uh, town of Lawrence, but that's, we don't want to get into the weeds there. So, but anyway, but, but Lincoln, it, 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 the argument that I've made in my book, uh, the, the black man's president, which is taken from Douglas's 1865 speech, June 1st, um, is that Lincoln was instinctively racial egalitarian. Uh, and when he makes those, when he makes that statement that is so widely quoted that we heard today at the Charleston debate in, against Stephen A. Douglas uh, in 1858, that's paying lip service to the voters who were being appealed to in the most demagogic, outrageous fashion by Stephen A. Douglas. Stephen A. Douglas was saying, this country was made by white men, for white men, the government, and black people don't have any right have to have to any, no, no social, uh, legal, uh, political rights, forget it. And Lincoln, so, and Douglas launches his campaign on July 9th, 1858 in Chicago. Lincoln happens to be in town, law case, so he then gives a speech on July 10th. And he attacks Douglas for this racial demagoguery. And he said, at the close of his speech, this was a really important speech, he says, let us stop all this quibbling about this man and that man, and this race and that race being inferior and must be placed in an inferior position. Let us discard all these things and unite as one nation, once again declaring that all men are created equal. And Douglas goes right after him and hammers him and hammers him and hammers him, and it was working. Hmm. The, the, the uh, voters of Illinois were arguably the most racist of uh, uh, the people in the, in the free states. Um, and, and, Doug, and so Lincoln was faced with this dilemma. If I don't respond to Douglas's taunts, he, that guarantees his victory. Guarantees it. And the most dangerous person in the country, Lincoln believed, who was most likely to make it possible for slavery to expand everywhere was Stephen A. Douglas. So he, he felt that he had to defeat Douglas, not just for his own vanity and his own political ambition, but Douglas was a really dangerous guy, and that he was trying to convince the public that there was no moral dimension to slavery, and that if he won the election, and he did so by anesthetizing the public about the morality of slavery, then the Supreme Court would then take a hint and say, slavery is legal everywhere, and it's going to be legal in New York and Maine and uh, everywhere. All right. Well, with that, thank you, gentlemen. And thank you, uh, thank you Michael. And I... Thank you. And I hope our DC audience uh, has enjoyed this or found it useful and purposeful as we really drill down on the fact that the DC story is the American story. So when we talk, every president lives here, or at least after, uh, as of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams for a minute, uh, but there are some presidents and some federal officials who had a particular impact upon Washington, D.C., and we upon them. And that is the purpose of these conversations and this series. I really want to thank again uh, the Ford's Theater. They've been magnificent. I want to thank Kellogg Foundation. <laughs> Community Foundation, Events DC, Destination DC, and also to those three working members of our Senior Advisory Committee, Carol Falk, Mark Thompson, and of course, I'm gonna come back to him again, our distinguished Michael Steele. Dr. Burlingame and Dr. Bonner, you were terrific. You so uh, and you've really enriched this evening. And again, thank you, Washington, D.C., for joining us tonight, participating tonight, and hopefully we've enriched each other. 
and until the next time when we talk about Frederick Douglass. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank Wonderful. You so much.